Hello, good evening all. Uh, my name is Dewey Cairn. I am a member at large to the uh, WASP board. Uh, we've had a busy week uh, uh, preparing for some of our activities that we're gonna be able to uh, give you a preview of this evening. Uh, welcome to uh, the first of our 2023 mini uh, conferences. Um, our speaker this evening to start off our program uh, will be John Z, as we call him. Uh, John is a uh, assistant professor of apiculture and urban entomology um, with uh, the University of Arkansas system. He's in Little Rock. Um, he has been a beekeeper for a good number of years uh, and with his family uh, have an apiary uh, that uh, uh, sell a number of different products of bees and also a type of, uh, of, of lifestyle uh, there from the Little Rock area. Tonight, we're going to be um, uh, talking communication. And uh, John, if you are ready to uh, uh, begin, we'd like to introduce John Z from the University of Arkansas. Hi, Dewey, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you all tonight. And give me just a second, I will share my screen. How's that look? It is coming up, yes. Uh, John, before you start, maybe uh, if people have questions that they'd like to put into the chat, we will have a Q&A session following uh, the presentation. Okay. All, yours. All right, thank you. Uh, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, as Dewey said, my name is John Zavishlock, which is why everybody calls me John Z or Dr. Z back here. And uh, with the University of Arkansas, and I love uh, working with honeybees. I've been doing it for about 24 years, so I'm starting to learn a, a thing or two. And Dewey asked me to talk to you all tonight about pheromones, which is uh, something that I find really fascinating uh, because it's something that's so important for our beehives, but it's something that many of us we hear about, but we may not necessarily understand a whole lot about them. So we know that honeybees communicate in a lot of different ways. They have all kinds of signals uh, in order to talk to each other. We're familiar with the waggle dance, of course, uh, and the other moves that they perform. They signal each other uh, to decide where to find food and, and when they're house hunting and things like that. Uh, they also signal each other to stop dancing. If a forager returns to the hive with news of danger, maybe there's a predator lurking at a site where another bee has been telling them to go, then they will vibrate rapidly against that other bee uh, with their thoracic muscles. They kind of buzz up against them and they are basically telling them to shut up about this, that place. You know, don't, don't send anyone else there. Of course, uh, house hunting bees will also swarm, or uh, house hunting swarms, sometimes the bees will also silence uh, bees that are dancing for particular directions. When the, the majority has made up their mind about where to go, they'll, they'll issue a stop signal to tell the other bees basically to, to knock it off. We've already made up our minds. So there's a lot of different vibrations going on in a hive, and uh, which is essentially what sound is. It's a vibration, and the bees can uh, detect a lot of those. They react to them in different ways. They can sense low-frequency sounds with their Johnston organs, which is in the, the antenna right there, and that kind of that elbow in the antenna where the pedestal and the scape meet. Um, honeybees produce a lot of frequencies with vibration on their own. Uh, and, and so, you know, oftentimes we may not be able to, to necessarily hear and, and determine what some of those are, but it's a lot of people that are trying to develop ways to listen in on bees and these vibrations, these sounds, the buzzing, uh, with the idea that maybe we can learn to interpret them and we can use, uh, you know, electronics to send a, a message to your cell phone that, that says your bees are about to swarm or something. Unfortunately, we're not really to that point yet. Uh, the most we could do is listen in and say, oh, too late. You missed it. Better luck next time. Uh, but, you know, as, as computing power gets faster and cheaper, then we might be able to, uh, to learn more about that. So, you know, a, a beehive is uh, a really noisy place, and there's a lot of signals going on, and chemical signals are one of the the main ways that bees communicate with each other. 
So I like this photo here. It's got a lot of bees all moving one direction, except for, for this one bee. She didn't get the message or she's just uh, marching to her own drum, but she seems to be going the, the opposite direction. Excellent. But there is a, a lot of noise going on inside of a hive and, and the bees have a lot of information that's coming and going all at once and they have to be able to uh, kind of differentiate between that. It's tr like trying to follow more than one conversation with different people in a crowded room at the same time. Uh, you know, honeybees use their antennas to detect odors and a lot of these pheromone signals are odors. Uh, you can actually hook electronics, electrodes up to honeybee antennas and measure the conductivity as different odors pass across the antenna. And so people have figured out uh, what kind of odors bees react to, uh, different food sources, and of course the different pheromones that we're gonna be talking about tonight. They're, they're very keyed in and very sensitive to sometimes very, very low concentrations of certain, uh, certain types of, of odors. So our, our bee colonies function as a super organism. It has to regulate itself and all of that activities in order to stay efficient. And so, of course, this requires very effective communication across uh, the entire colony. You know, they have lots of systems to keep tabs on what's going on, the state of the colony, uh, what the needs of the colony are. Um, there's, there's lots of systems, signals, and feedback loops that constantly relay all this information back and forth to every single hive member. Uh, and, and pheromone language is ideal for honeybees. They're in the dark. They can't see other bees most of the time. Um, and, and most of the bees are on the opposite side of a comb, out of sight anyway. And so this is a fairly advanced and elaborate and really ideally effective system of communication for that hive environment. And these pheromones can be used to communicate information in lots of different ways. Uh, it can go to or from a single individual bee, maybe from a larva to a nurse bee or from an individual bee to the whole colony at once. Uh, think of alarm pheromone or Nazanoff scent or um, queen pheromones. They can also be made over very short distances or very long distances. Uh, they can send out a very brief message or they can remain in circulation for a long period of time. So pheromones really organize and regulate the whole colony's hierarchical structure and many of its functions, many of its activities. Uh, there's pheromones involved in almost every interaction between bees. They can elicit immediate reactions between the bees that, that get that message, like alarm pheromone, or they can induce very uh, long-term physiological states. They can also inhibit significant states and, and activities. So they can do this in other colony members and even in other species. You've probably at least heard the word pheromone, and so you're familiar with the concept. Uh, and, and a lot of times we think of them in terms of odors, and lots of other animals use pheromones, but they're particularly popular in insects for communicating over long distances, for finding mates and, and things like that. Uh, we probably react to subtle pheromones and, and we don't even know it. We think we're above that because we're, you know, such intelligent reasoning animals. But on some fundamental level, we probably react to, to subtle signals as well. But uh, these pheromones are chemical signals that are produced by an animal, which induce a behavioral or a, a physiological response in another member of their, their same species. So queen substance, alarm odor, Nazanov scent, we have names for these and, and we may be familiar with some of them, but not exactly sure how they work. These same chemicals in, that the bees are using can also function uh, as what biologists call chiromones. So basically they do the same thing, but they're eliciting a response in another species. And it favors the creature that receives that message more than the one that sends it out. So these may be the same chemicals, but we use a different term when they're received by something of a different receiver. So think of parasitic mites recognizing a suitable host. You know, the Varroa can detect the difference between a worker larva and a drone larva by the odors, by the brood pheromones, and they will enter a drone cell 
if they have a choice over a drone or a worker. Uh, we, we know that they prefer those. So that's an example of a different species keying in on these same pheromones. Uh, some bees can also detect varroa mites pre-producing, uh, you know, that elicits that hygienic uncapping removal. So this is, this could also be a chiromone. We're not exactly sure what's going on there. It may be an odor given off by a wounded bee. It may be an odor that's given off by reproducing mites. Uh, there's still some debate about that. But uh, there's some evidence that small hive beetles may react to various odors in the hive as well. And these same chemicals can also uh, function as what's called an allomone. So these are similar chemical signals. They produce an effect on another individual, but it becomes favorable to the one that produced it, not really to the one that receives that message. So these are, you can think of these as your con artist pheromones, like uh, laying workers are not good for a colony. Uh, they can produce kind of a quasi queen pheromone that makes other bees accept them as a queen uh, or and feed them, tend them, kind of draw a retinue to them. Uh, sometimes to the point where a colony may not easily accept a mated queen. Uh, Cape honeybees are, also can change their odors and appear more queen like. So in both of these situations, the colony will eventually dwindle away with without a real queen. So um, these are are, are kind of chemicals that are, are fooling the majority of the bees. So these pheromones, as I said, they're involved in just about every aspect of the colony's daily life and all of their activities. And all of the bees that are doing all of these different jobs are constantly feeding information back into the system. And pheromones are going both ways between all of these colony members. You know, queens interact differently between each other and between workers, uh, between drones. Drones inside the hive and outside the hive will respond differently to queens in and out of the hive. Uh, workers interact with other workers, whether they belong in that hive or not. And same with uh, the drones and the adult bees and the, the, the brood react differently. Uh, the worker, the adult bees will, will tend to the brood differently based on the, the pheromones that they're receiving from them. So uh, we can start our discussion with queen pheromone because it's probably one that we have heard the most about and maybe you've given some thought to, even if we don't quite understand maybe all the biology that goes into it. But you know, the presence of that queen is one of the main regulatory factors in the colony that it regulates its, its function and how all the bees are relating to the colony as a whole. But that queen pheromone is not just one chemical. It's, uh, it's a lot of different things produced from multiple different glands. And so there's not one single queen pheromone. Each queen also has her own unique blend of all these different substances. And that gives her a unique identity and it helps the other bees to recognize her as distinct from another queen from another hive. But all of the bees in this colony also take on their own queen's pheromone. And so they can recognize nest mates as different than bees from a colony with a different queen. So we have different names for this. Some people will call it queen scent or queen signal or queen odor, uh, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's all a blend of queen pheromones. And the workers are continually evaluating their queen. The more pheromones that she produces, the better they register their queen to be. She's probably younger, she's laying more eggs, she's healthier, and she's producing a lot of good pheromones. As she ages or if she becomes injured for any reason, uh, anything happens to her, that level of pheromone begins to dwindle. And eventually she'll get to the point where she's not producing enough, and then the bees will supersede her and they'll replace her. Of course, in the absence of a queen, they recognize that sudden drop in queen pheromone and they quickly rear emergency cells from the brood that's available. If they don't do that right away, then they're gonna miss out on that opportunity because within a few days, all the eggs are gonna be gone, all the larvae will be too old to rear a good queen. So, after about two weeks of no queen, when that colony gets to be hopelessly queenless, then we see a big increase in the number of laying workers because part of the, the function of that queen pheromone is to inhibit uh, the, the development 
of the ovaries in the worker bees. We'll get to that a little bit more in, in a minute. So in, in the absence of the queen or in the event of queen death, then we have that absence of queen substance. And, and bees will uh, begin rearing the queen just within hours of detecting that there is, is that sudden drop. Of course, we can uh, utilize that behavior if we want to rear queens. You can set up a starter hive with lots of healthy, young, well-fed bees that are queenless and let them sit for a few hours and they register that they're queenless and it puts them into uh, a mood to really rear a lot of queens out if we give them uh, just a few grafts, right? So when the queen substance and all of the brood pheromones are both absent, then laying workers become much more common. So uh, they, they both work in tandem there. And uh, of course this results in, laying workers results in a lot of drones and a decrease of workers because uh, we have uh, all the, the worker bees are, are getting old and they're dying of old age and they're not being replaced. So then the colony just starts to get disorganized and dirty. Food stores start to get depleted. Basically the whole system falls apart because they don't have this system of pheromones that is regulating it all together. It becomes more susceptible to pests and predators and pathogens and, and everything else. So. Uh, the queen bee making these pheromones is, is what makes her so attractive, like this beautiful specimen that we see right here. Uh, and queens begin to produce uh, this when they are young. It forms a, a retinue of caregivers around her that feed her and groom her and take care of her. And, and they probably give her a pep talk every time she lays an egg. They pat her on the back and say, great job, mom. We love you. You're doing fine. Uh, the pheromones also make her attractive to drones. Uh, once she is about six days old, it, she uh, takes on a, a number. She the, the pheromones that she's producing are changing a little bit. And uh, drones, once they are about six to eight days old, will, will start to uh, react differently to, to the queens. They're not attracted to her inside the hive, but they are attracted to her outside in a drone congregation area so they don't act the same way indoors. And it may be a function of the, uh, the quantity of, of the pheromones. So it's like being in an elevator or in a car with somebody who's wearing way too much perfume or cologne. It's just overpowering and it's unpleasant. A little bit goes a long way. So maybe when they're outside, they find that odor to be uh, very nice and very attractive, but inside the concentration is so high, it actually may have a repellent effect on them. Uh, the queen pheromone also helps to keep that swarm cohesive. So when they are landing, then, uh, you know, gathering around that queen, uh, they're all pr producing pheromones, but she is producing queen pheromone. And if they settle on a tree limb like this without a queen, for some reason they left without her, she wasn't ready to go, they'll break up pretty quickly and they will return to the hive and they'll try again when she goes. And, uh, they also are attracted to her scent in the air. And of course, she's attracted to the other bees uh, during that. So we'll talk about another pheromone involved in that in a little bit. So queen pheromones are how you can play with bees and impress your friends and you can, you can wear a bee beard. So typically a, a queen is caged and you can place it under your chin, tie it around your neck and, and dump out a bunch of bees. And when they gather around, then uh, they are attracted to that, that queen. And since they're outside of their hive, they have no, no brood to protect, no food to protect. So they're uh, attracted to that queen scent and they're not quite as likely to defend themselves, although uh, there's no, no guarantees on that. One of the main components of queen pheromones is the queen mandibular pheromone or QMP. And uh, this is actually a very diverse compound that has a lot of different ingredients. Uh, we know that there's at least 18 chemicals in this cocktail. Um, these are the most important ones right here, these five, but there's a bunch of other ones as well in much smaller doses. And uh, this blend uh, tends to change over time. Uh, and as the queen ages, uh, a virgin queen has a lot more 9-ODA 
And as, after she's mated, she has less of that. So that's one that's particularly makes her attractive to the, the drones in mating flights. It also uh, causes different reactions with the worker bees. It's one of the main ones that uh, uh, entices them to come around and, and form that retinue as well. Uh, the other components uh, are, are also important. They're produced in different parts of the queen's body. And uh, uh, a lot of pheromones are much less active or maybe even inactive alone, but in the presence of this queen mandibular pheromone, then they become a lot more potent and they elicit a, a much stronger reaction. So a lot of these are, are working together through a number of different pathways. So as I said, it changes a little bit over time and elicits different responses with different bees when she's newly emerged, when she's mating and, and after mating, the bees will react to them uh, much differently. This pheromone is produced in glands just inside the head above the mandibles, which is why it's mandibular pheromone. And there's a short duct toward the base of the, ma of the mandible and the uh, product that it secretes runs along this channel, which is surrounded by lots of little hairs. And so this increases the surface area and uh, they all get coated and it increases the amount of this pheromone that stays present. It's also passed to the other bees as she is being fed. So when the queen is being attended by workers, then they receive this QMP when they're feeding her. And of course, uh, they turn around and they interact with other bees. As the queen's laying eggs, they stop and they gossip and they share food and they pick up that pheromone from the retinue bees. And those bees in turn share with other bees and those share with other bees, even foraging bees that are out outside the hive most of the day, they come back and they unload honey. And as they do, they are picking up some pheromones from the bees inside the house. And so uh, every single bee in the colony is receiving a dose of this pheromone every single day, kind of on a constant level, a little here and a little there, but, but more or less constantly. And the queen actually receives her own mandibular pheromone fed back to her with the royal jelly when the workers are tending to her. And this is actually very important. It helps to function and regulate uh, queen rearing because uh, when this mandibular pheromone is sufficiently high, it inhibits swarming and supersedure. But when it's low, uh, in cases where the queen is injured or if she just is getting really old, then that's when this level begins to drop and workers begin supersedure. They detect that at, at a, a fairly early stage. They start to, to discuss amongst themselves that maybe mom's not doing so good anymore and we might wanna come up with a, a backup plan, a plan B when she's not looking. So when the colony population is very large, and a queen is producing a fair amount of pheromone, then every bee is still receiving some, but they're receiving less on a per capita basis, on a, on a per bee basis, because there's just so many bees in the hive. And when each individual bee starts getting less, this promotes that swarming to, uh, to begin. Uh, if you think about a pizza, it's a pretty good sized meal for one or two people. When a couple more folks show up at your door, you, you can cut it again. Everybody still gets a, a quarter of a pie. That's not bad. And then your neighbors come over. Well, we'll just slice it again. And then uh, they invited some friends and they invited some friends. And pretty soon you got a house full of people and you've only got one pizza. Everybody gets a very small slice. It's not enough to fill you up. You're still hungry. And so it's kind of the same way with a large population of bees. You've got a queen that can only produce so much pheromone and each bee is still hungry for a little bit more. They're not quite getting enough to satisfy them. And the queen herself is not getting enough fed back to her. So she reacts by looking for these, uh, these queen cups, these shallow vertical cells on the, the edges, the bottoms of combs. And she will deposit an egg in the queen cup. And worker bees recognize that that egg is hanging in that vertical position that orientation and they will rear them out as swarm cells. So it's the queen that actually initiates the swarming behavior. And she does that because she doesn't get enough of her own uh, regulatory pheromone. 
And this is one reason you might sometimes hear people say that older queens tend to, to swarm more than younger queens. It's because this drop in pheromone that is registering with the queen herself over time. So she's, she's recognizing that she's getting older. But this pheromone itself inhibits workers from starting queen rearing on their own except in the case of, of uh, you know, supersedure cells where the, the level of pheromone is low. But it does not stop them from caring for queen larvae. So this is why you can introduce hundreds of larvae in the right position upside down and, and these queen cups and grafted larvae or any other method that you want into a, a queenless colony and they will rear them out as queens. Actually, it doesn't even have to be queenless. They'll still start them, but the queen may come along and, and chew them out if there's no queen excluder. So it, it inhibits them from starting queen rearing, but it won't inhibit them from caring for those queen cells. Uh, this pheromone also suppresses uh, worker reproduction or laying workers. So workers do have ovaries. They just remain, for the most part, underdeveloped in the presence of queen mandibular pheromone. Uh, there are always gonna be probably a few workers that are going to, to try to lay a few eggs, but it's typically policed by the other bees and, and they may be removed. So normally workers don't lay eggs. We like it when everything works the way it should, but in the absence of that queen pheromone, those ovaries do become active. Uh, so they these laying workers have fewer ovarials and, and of course they, can't lay as many eggs, but they can produce only drones. And so that leads to this hopelessly queenless colony that uh, eventually will fall apart. Uh, this works with other pheromones to suppress worker reproduction. So uh, the, the brood pheromones are probably the, the most important factor that keeps laying workers from developing, but there's not always brood in the colony. So you can have a a long winter, you can have a, a long dearth where uh, they're nutritionally stressed and the queen may stop laying or any other break in the brood cycle. Uh, like when, when bees swarm, uh, they move out into another colony. And so uh, we have these, these other methods, these, these uh, kind of backup uh, methods that, that keep the worker ovaries from developing at least for a time. Other components of the, the overall blend of queen substance are produced in other parts of the queen's body. And one of the most important places are the turgal glands. So uh, bees have exoskeletons. The turgites are these plates on the back of the abdomen. Sternites are on the underside, the, the ventral side. So the dorsal side are called turgites. And in between each of the plates is a thin membrane that hooks it together, which bends and allows the that tough exoskeleton to, uh, to flex around and move. And there is a gland there called a turgle gland that secretes uh, another pheromone, which is part of that queen substance. So this is why if you observe bees interacting with the queen, you'll see them lick and antennae, tap that bee, the queen's abdomen with their antennae. And they clean her and groom her. They're picking up a lot of this pheromone from the queen's abdomen. And this is uh, mostly associated with mated queens. It's not associated uh, with virgin queens nearly as much. So um, they, it makes them uh, care a whole lot about the queen's abdomen. And maybe that's because that's where all the egg laying is going on. And it may be that they are somehow detecting the rate at which she's laying eggs and she's doing a great job. And so they're, they're really keeping an eye on that part of the queen that is so important for the future of the colony. And this is another one that's thought to suppress ovary development in the worker bees. And it will be passed around from bee to bee uh, as part of that, that food that they share. All bees have footprint glands. Uh, so they, they are present in the queens, the workers, and the drones. So as the queen walks around, she deposits this colorless, uh, oily substance on the surface of the comb. And it may function to help the workers keep track of, of where the queen is. If they, they need to find mom, uh, maybe they can track her down. Uh, but it also seems to inhibit queen cell construction in areas where the queen is actively laying. So uh, maybe they, they find a place that's got some larvae, 
the queen deposited some eggs and moved on. She's not on this comb, so uh, they can sneak around and, and turn some of those into new queens when their mom's not looking, perhaps. Uh, it, it's another one that works with the mandibular pheromone by itself. It's not terribly active, but, but it, it's all part of that, that same blend. And this is something that diminishes as the queen ages. So this is one of the components that starts to disappear first. And the, the workers may be judging the quality and, of the queen and as the age of the queen by how much of, of this stuff she's tracking around. Another important pheromone is produced inside the abdomen in the, what's called the Dufour's gland, and it's associated with uh, egg production. So as she lays an egg, she tags the surface of that egg with this chemical secretion that basically marks it with her seal of approval. This is indeed a queen produced egg and your worker bees can tell the difference. They can tell if a, a queen has produced that egg or if it was a laying worker, a sneaky little sister that produced that egg. And uh, the workers often will remove those eggs uh, through what's called worker policing. As they go around tending to the comb, they can detect that and they'll actually chew up and remove uh, over 90% of, of worker produced eggs normally uh, just within about six to eight hours. Uh, and after those eggs have hatched out, there doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, a lot of discernment, uh, they will uh, still rear out a drone that has been produced by a worker. But if they catch it in the egg stage, they, they typically try to remove it. The queen herself will sometimes eat worker produced eggs. So it's a, a little chewy protein snack that she might find if she comes along and inspects a cell and she finds an egg there, she'll say, wait a minute, that is not one of mine. And so uh, she'll make a little snack out of that. This is another one of the chemicals that helps to attract the retinue to the mated queen. So uh, they know she's genuine because she's producing an official egg marking pheromone as well. So they can probably detect that uh, odor coming from her body. And uh, laying workers do produce a kind of similar compound. Um, it's, it produces a much weaker effect. It can help to attract the mated queen or uh, attract the retinue to laying workers, but really only in the absence of a real queen. When there's a, an actual queen there, a real mated queen, uh, the bees aren't fooled. They can really tell the difference and they're not going to be taken in by a laying worker. But in the absence of a queen, uh, they tend to think, well, maybe that's a queen. I don't know. There's no other queen around here. So uh, they'll go ahead and, and give that laying worker a little bit of attention. But the function of this pheromone, basically, it relays that the colony is queen right, and the queen's healthy, and she's laying eggs, and, and she's doing her job. So again, it works with the mandibular pheromone to prevent that worker ovary development, all part of the same system. Now, queens produce a, uh, a special pheromone that is unique to them that's found in their feces, and they only produced it when they're about 24 hours old. So this lasts for up to about two weeks. And this is the time when those young queen bees may be having some unpleasant encounters with other workers or with sister queens, rival queens. And so the, uh, in order to defend themselves, uh, they actually discharge this, their, their feces at another bee or at a worker that's being aggressive towards them. And it contains this special pheromone. So it repels other workers and induces grooming behavior. And I think that's perfectly understandable. I think if someone was uh, throwing feces at me, I would be very repelled and it would certainly induce grooming behavior. It's said to reduce aggression, but I don't know, I, I might become more aggressive if you started doing that to me, but apparently it works in, in honeybees. But after a, a couple of weeks, uh, this begins to disappear. Of course, by then the queen should be mated and she's taken on her role as the, the new queen mother, and she's producing a lot of other pheromones that are um, really instilling loyalty in the other bees. Uh, it's, it's particularly used uh, uh, when rival queens are fighting each other. 
And speaking of you know what, uh, this paper actually came out a couple of years ago and I thought it was kind of interesting. Uh, there is another use for feces that has to do with pheromones. In Vietnam, um, there is a large hornet called Vesposaurus. This is not the uh, the famed murder hornets that uh, invaded the West Coast and were predicted uh, to be the, the next plague of beekeeping. Uh, this one is is found in, in Vietnam and other parts of Southeast Asia. But when these hornets, def uh, when they find a colony of Apis serrana, they come up to it and they actually rub the tip of their abdomen across the front of the beehive, tagging it with a pheromone that is essentially some graffiti that says, I'll be back and I'm bringing my friends. And that's what they do. They fly back to their nest and they recruit other hornets for a big meal. And when they lead them back, uh, they can invade that hive and cause a lot of havoc. And what researchers have found in Vietnam is that the honeybees actually go and find uh, pig manure and they gather up manure and bring it to the front of the hive and they smear it over the area where the hornets have placed their marking pheromone and cover it up and actually mask the hornet pheromone so that when the hornets come back, they're not able to detect the, uh, the hive that, that they had marked. And so it's found that after uh, these, these hornets have have come around, the amount of pig feces on the front of the beehive, uh, it increases dramatically, but it helps to, to keep the hive safe. So um, I suppose that uh, it's a pheromone when the, when the hornets are using it, but you could make a case that it's a chiromone uh, when the bees detect it because it is eliciting a reaction in the honeybee. It initiates that, that feces gathering behavior. So it's beneficial to the bees that have detected it, but not to the hornet that left it there. So uh, kind of works both ways. Another pheromone in the, the queen honeybee and also in the worker bee is uh, produced in the land. And the uh, composition uh, is very caste specific and, and the function is caste specific in each one. So in queens, it's just part of that overall queen scent blend. And it starts to degenerate once a queen is about a year old. So it contributes to that, that loss of signal in older queens. It helps the workers to recognize that their queen is getting older and, and, and headed towards replacement. But in worker bees, it is produced uh, as alarm pheromone. So this is isopinyl acetate. This is that famous banana odor uh, that is produced by honeybees. It's produced in this Koshevnikov gland and it is released when bees sting and it is there to tag you or any other intruder as a danger to the hive so that when honeybees uh, come out to deal with a threat, they know exactly who it is. So, you know, if you get stung on the hand and you don't, uh, don't, don't puff a little bit of smoke over that sting, and when you get the stinger out, uh, then, you know, a bee may come back and, and try to sting that same spot on your hand again, because you have been tagged in that specific spot as an intruder. Uh, that second bee didn't know what you did to make the first one upset. They just know that, that you have been labeled as a, a bad guy. And so they're going to do what it is they're supposed to do. So it will attract and, and provoke more bees to do that. You know, alarm pheromone is perhaps one of the, the ones that we are most familiar with. It's one of the few that we can actually detect just by sniffing around in the air. And of course, it's released when a bee feels threatened. Uh, and it excites and alarms other bees that there's danger, and it tags the intruder as a specific threat. It's, uh, the chemical is highly volatile. It's a small molecule, and it spreads very rapidly in the air, and so when there is an emergency situation, uh, this stuff is everywhere really fast, which is uh, one reason that um, Africanized bees become so dangerous is because uh, they, they spread a lot more of this, uh, they react much more quickly and release this and they, they bring a lot more, uh, a lot more bees to guard duty when they indeed uh, do detect it. Because it's a small, very volatile molecule, then it also dissipates very quickly. So once the threat is over, bees will stop 
producing it and it dissipates very quickly when the wind blows it away, that doesn't mean that the individual bees are necessarily going to go back into a calm mood really quickly. They can stay upset for a little while uh, beyond edge, even though the source of that pheromone has, has disappeared. So uh, we need to still be mindful of them. There is another alarm pheromone, which is called 2-heptanone, and it is the mandibular alarm pheromone. So this one is released when uh, a honeybee bites. Uh, so not just stinging, but uh, when there is, say, an intruder bee, a, a robber bee trying to sneak in, and the guard bees uh, may bite it and tag it with, with this without having to resort to stinging it yet, then it it lets other bees understand that this particular one may have been tagged as an intruder. Uh, it also functions uh, to anesthetize varroa mites. So when a bee bites a varroa mite, uh, basically uh, they are paralyzed temporarily. And so this is probably something that allows the, uh, the bees to you know, remove them more easily uh, because they're not kicking and screaming. And, and so uh, this may be something that uh, has evolved to uh, have the same reaction on other things such as, as wax moths. I'm not sure about that, but seems like a, a good adaptation to get rid of mites. So I hope the bees are still working on that and are gonna, gonna continue to, to utilize that. Smoke. It's not really a pheromone, but you could make a case that smoke acts kind of as an alimone. You know, it's emitted by a beekeeper and it has an immediate short-term releaser effect on, on honeybees by keeping them calm. And it benefits the beekeeper, but not necessarily the bees. Sometimes we do terrible things to bees after we've smoked them, like take all of their honey. Uh, but people found out uh, thousands of years ago that you can use smoke to uh, keep a beehive uh, uh, a little bit more calm. And so if you... Uh, you know, it's a real success story in our, our management of honeybees. The old logic, uh, people said, was that bees dwell in trees and the forest, and they think it's a forest fire when they sell, smell smoke, so they gorge themselves on honey. And they, they may do that if you oversmoke them, but uh, you really don't want your bees ripping open all the sealed honey cells and, and gorging themselves. So if your bees are doing that, you're probably using too much smoke. Um, this smoker right here. This is the one uh, typically that we use in the U.S. This is one that is found in Latin America. So it's a very large smoker. And from what I understand, uh, beekeepers there where there are Africanized bees, they'll, they'll have one guy whose job it is just to run the great big smoker full time while you're opening up your beehive. So if you see that guy running away, uh, you better better do your best to keep up with him. Worker bees also have a number of pheromones. So uh, one of them uh, is called forager pheromone for, for lack of a better term and uh, doesn't really have any other fancy name, but ethyl oleate is, uh, it's released by older foraging bees. And it functions to slow down the rate at which nurse bees are maturing. So what this does is it regulates the age task structure of a colony. If you have a large population of bees in your hive and there's not a lot of flowers outside, then there's no sense in sending all of the bees out just because they reach a certain age because flying around outside during a nectar dearth exposes them to predators and other dangers. Uh, it's best to keep them in the hive, uh, cleaning and, and taking care of things intending to the brood. Uh, and then if anything, uh, if they do find anything, then, then of course they can bring them out. But just the, the presence of a bunch of older foragers hanging around the hive kind of keeps them in that younger physiological state. Now in the, so it, it maintains that optimum ratio of nurses and foragers for whatever the colony needs. If for some reason uh, conditions change, uh, you have a good fall flow in your location, perhaps then um, 
more bees are outside, they're flying around, they're dying sooner. And so you have less of this forager pheromone and more bees are going to mature into that role at a, a faster rate. Uh, also, if you have a sudden absence of older bees, uh, such as maybe you have a pesticide kill or something like that, or it could be uh, a beekeeper makes a split and you take all the older bees away and you've got a bunch of younger bees, uh, then the absence of older bees causes uh, what's called precocious foraging. The younger bees move into that older bee role ahead of when they would normally be scheduled to do so. They can do those jobs of guarding and foraging and things like that, but they're not as efficient as bees that are naturally aged. Uh, it takes a while for their brains to develop, uh, so they have good decision-making ability and also uh, the ability to form memories, uh, which is important for navigation, to fly out of the hive, memorize all the visual landmarks, do trigonometry to calculate where the sun is located, fly two miles away, recognize a brand new flower you've never seen before, figure out how to get the nectar out of it, do that 50 times and then calculate your way back to the hive now that the sun has moved. So bees are doing that all day long, but the younger bees that have moved into that role prematurely, their brains are not quite as well developed and they aren't quite as efficient at doing that. So each trip that they make takes longer and they make fewer trips per day. And of course, if you have a situation where uh, bees are exposed to danger, such as pesticides or predators or whatever, and a lot of the older bees are removed, the younger bees move in prematurely, and then suddenly they're removed from the population because the danger still exists, then you have this uh, cascading effect of more and more precocious foragers, uh, and it begins to deplete the population of, of nurse bees in the hive. And this is something that was really investigated when colony collapse disorder was first reported and, and bees were suddenly disappearing. Uh, what's causing this to happen and so rapidly? And, and so uh, something that, that triggered this may have uh, been having some of those effects at the time. But uh, you know, a lot of that is, is still kind of, kind of fuzzy and, and uh, up, to, up to some people's just best guesses. Of course, in the absence of nurse bees, older bees can also regress back to doing those young bee jobs, but again, they are not as efficient at it. The hypopharyngeal glands, for instance, have, uh, have grown and then they've kind of peaked and then they begin to atrophy a little bit as the bees move into that foraging mode. They can regress back, eat a lot of protein, a lot of pollen and, and regrow their hypopharyngeal glands, but they'll never quite be back where they were. So again, they're not quite as efficient, but there's a certain amount of plasticity that's built into the, the bee's behavior. And so uh, they, they are able to do that. Another pheromone that we may be familiar with, or at least in, in name and, and kind of the behavior uh, is the Nazanov pheromone. So we may be familiar with seeing bees taking this posture at the entrance of the hive. When you install a swarm in a hive or you hive package bees and things like that, anytime bees are in an unfamiliar situation, her head goes down, her, her abdomen goes up in the air and she starts to fan her wings very rapidly without taking off in flight. And so right here between the, the sixth and seventh tergite is this little, little pale stripe, and that's the Nasanov gland. And uh, this, is a, this functions to um, recruit and aggregate bees to one spot. So if the bees are in an unfamiliar place, maybe you've opened up a hive and you've shaken a lot of bees out that are young bees and they've never been there before, or you drop a swarm into a hive, you got a lot of confused bees. So the ones that are at the entrance of the hive are giving off this plume of pheromone into the air. And you have a lot of other bees that are basically flying around in random patterns around the hive, not sure what's going on. And when they detect that Nasanov scent, 
Uh, they follow it upwind to its source. And of course, its source is the back end of another bee, but that bee is here at the entrance of the hive. And so it helps to bring these lost, confused bees back down into the hive. And once they're at the entrance, then they can follow the other scents and they can find their way in and they can make themselves at home. They will also recognize uh, that these other bees are part of their own hive, their own colony, by the odors, the queen odors that are on these other bees. So it helps lost and, and disoriented bees, and it smells a, a, quite a bit like lemongrass oil. So um, in, in places like Africa, they actually they rub lemongrass, lemongrass roots on the insides of uh, empty hives when they put them up in trees to bait them and attract swarms. And you can use lemongrass to uh, try to bring bees into uh, a swarm box that, that you may have put out. Uh, it's, it's very similar to some of the swarm lures that, uh, that they, they sell. It's got uh, the lemongrass oil chemicals in it, uh, the same components, uh, as well as some other things that perhaps mimic queen pheromones. Everybody has their, their own proprietary blend. So when a, a hive swarms, that colony swarms, they are producing, of course, there's a queen in the center of this mass of bees, but all of these bees are also producing a fair amount of this Nasanov scent. So when those bees go off and, and just a handful of them are scouting around looking for a hollow tree, they can come back and they can report to the rest of the hive what they found. And then it's an amazing sight if you, you've ever seen it. Uh, when this swarm begins to break up into a, a big cloud of bees, and then that whole cloud starts to all fly off in the same direction. And the way they do that is that that handful of scout bees that has actually been you know, a mile away and found a tree and said, yes, this is where we want to move into. They came back and they did their dances. And so now you have what appears to be just a big chaotic mass of bees flying in all directions. But those scout bees zip through the middle of this cloud of bees very rapidly from one end to the other in the direction towards the tree they're going to. And when they get to the front of that cloud of bees, they kind of hang back slowly and make their way to the back of a, a line again, and then they'll zip through very quickly. And other bees are also constantly zipping through the middle, and they're giving off a lot of this Nasanov scent. They'll hang back and zip through, but every time the bee moves forward through this cloud of, of honeybees, she goes a little bit farther along each time. And so the this handful of scout bees is leading that entire mass of 20,000 bees through the air, with a trail of pheromones that they are producing. And it's strong enough that they can bring all of those bees a mile or more through the air to find that one little knot hole way up on the side of a tree that none of them have ever been to before. But they can follow that, that trail through the sky that's made out of pheromones. And to the bees, it's as obvious as if it was a, a neon sign to us. So that's pretty amazing. Uh, the same pheromone can also be used to recruit foragers to a water source. So if uh, water does not have a distinct odor uh, and the bees find it uh, when they, they come down here to take a drink, they may sometimes give off a little Nazanov scent and that helps other water foragers who are looking for a drink to kind of zero in on that spot. Uh, and if they find a source of food like sugar syrup, uh, maybe at a big open feeder and it's just sugar and water doesn't have a characteristic scent, then sometimes foragers will also use uh, this the same signal to help other bees to be able to find that. And of course, uh, it's released when workers are assembled at a hive entrance. When a virgin queen is getting ready to depart on mating flights, uh, a bunch of the, the other bees kind of gather around there and they will give off some Nasanov scent and it helps the queen to orient uh, as she is, is taken in visual landmarks and then she flies off to mate. When she is on her way back, that helps her to zero in on uh, that hive that she needs to return to. And of course, these bees have a lot invested on the success of that queen, so they want her to, to come back. 
mentioned that uh, footprint pheromones are, are present in all the bees uh, and in, in queens and also worker bees. So think about that, that wild colony, little tiny knot hole way up high in a tree in the middle of a forest where all the trees look the same to us. How do bees find that one little spot? Well, millions and millions of teeny tiny bee footprints build up around the entrance of this colony. As bees come and go, they're landing here, constantly moving in and out over time, this kind of oily secretion builds up here and it sort of creates a bullseye that's really dense at the entrance and then kind of fades to the outside, but it helps bees that are flying along to really zero in on the entrance to the colony and help them make a, a more precision landing. There's also some evidence that uh, this footprint pheromone may mark flowers that have been visited by bees. So if you if you watch bees work in a patch of clover, they, they kind of buzz around a flower. There's a bunch of little tiny flowers and they don't land at each one. They have to stop and probe a flower to find out if it's got nectar or not. And so as they approach, they seem to be able to sense, hey, a bee has been here recently and already collected the nectar from that flower. So they move on and to another and another, and then they'll finally land when they found one that, that nobody's been on lately. So this may temporarily mark a flower as having been recently visited. There's also some evidence that uh, flowers have an electrical field and bees build up a charge when their wings are flapping and when they land on a flower, it can invert that charge temporarily. So bees may also be detecting an electrical field around a flower that's too weak for us to be able to detect, but uh, a honeybee may be able to sense that in a way we don't quite understand yet. So there's probably uh, more than one thing going on there that, that we can still learn about. Drones have pheromones as well. Uh, they do produce mandibular pheromones. Uh, they, their mandibular glands are much smaller than workers or in queens. And it probably functions to attract other drones to uh, a drone congregation area. Nobody's entirely sure because drones are, are really so understudied compared to workers and queens. But it, it probably helps to keep that congregation area somewhat cohesive. It keeps the bees kind of centered within the boundaries of it. And it may also help to attract virgin queens to those congregation areas. There's other visual cues going on that have to do with the landscape. But uh, once they, they get close enough, uh, they, they typically find each other by these pheromones. And of course, the drone uh, understands that the queen is, is indeed a receptive queen by her odors too. So uh, these pheromones help the bees on the dating scene to get together. Drones also have those tarsal glands that produce pheromones. Uh, it's not entirely understood what its biological function is. It may have something to do with uh, that the workers round them up and, and kick them out in the, the fall. So when the when it starts to get cold and the flowers disappear and they eject all the drones from the colony, uh, this may be one way that the workers uh, track them down and, and find them, but nobody's entirely sure about that. It's very likely that drones have other pheromones that determine their acceptance in a colony or their rejection, but typically drones are allowed to drift from colony to colony. And uh, so there's probably some other pheromones going on with them that, that we don't entirely understand. So uh, that's a, a great idea for somebody who wants to study bees and, and really loves chemistry. And the brood also has its own pheromones. Uh, worker bees can tell the difference between different larvae based on their age, their cast, and, and things like that. So as a nurse bee wanders across a cell, across the comb, all she has to do is dip her antennae down into that cell and she gets an instant reading on how old that larva is, how, what it needs to be fed, whether it, it's gonna become a queen or it's a worker or it's a drone, et cetera. So this is a case of a uh, very short distance that a pheromone is going to travel. You wouldn't want that pheromone to, to travel too far or it's gonna overwhelm you know, the neighboring cells. But as a group, all of them together are producing a pheromone that, that as I said, it, it helps to regulate the ovary development in the workers and, and reduce the, 
abundance of, of laying workers as long as there is a lot of brood there. And of course, we know that uh, the varroa mite is attracted to the brood pheromones. That varroa mite is tiny, but it's got uh, a lot going on in its tiny little brain. You know, it uh, can determine whether or not a cell contains uh, a worker or a drone. That mite can actually tell whether this nurse, how old this nurse bee is by the odors uh, given off by her body. Uh, it's called cuticular volatiles. As a bee ages, she's giving off a uh, different, basically a bee body odor, which changes over time. And the varroa mite can detect that and can determine the age of the honeybee and knows that it wants to be on a, a bee that is of a particular age uh, that will be feeding the oldest larva, the ones that are just about ready to get capped. So when this larva reaches a certain size, about five and a half days old, it gives off an odor that says, oh, I'm stuffed, I couldn't eat another bite, go ahead and seal up my cell, I think I'm ready to pupate. And of course, at that point, the mite says, aha, and runs down into the bottom of the cell and hides in that food. So um, then once it's sealed up, of course, that mite comes out uh, and, and reproduces underneath the, the sealed cell. And uh, basically, it is protected for the next uh, 12 days or so. <clears throat> so hygienic bees can detect mites. Uh, not sure exactly what's going on. There's There may be multiple factors, but uh, it's the bees antenna that are probably detecting odors either from the mites or from the larva that are being wounded or both. And they're able to uh, uncap those cells and, and remove the mites, remove uh, the larva. And that's what we call that hygienic behavior and there's there's different genes involved and, and there's probably different cues involved with different things. Of course, uh, there's a lot of interest in developing artificial pheromones. So we can we can talk to the bees and, and we can communicate with them and, and tell them what we, we want them to do. And that would be great if we could command the bees, but uh, we're not quite to that point. We've probably all seen different types of uh, swarm pheromones, uh, swarm lures as, as they are. Uh, this is essentially lemongrass oil, but uh, they also have other components that are related to, uh, to the different bee pheromones, but it's designed to make an empty hive be more attractive to house hunting bees, those scout bees, so they'll stop and they'll check it out. And if you can get a scout bee to look inside and it, it becomes attractive, then of course they might lead the rest of the swarm back to it and you've got some free bees. So that's all well and good. There are other pheromones that have been developed, other artificial pheromones. Uh, you can buy one called Temp Queen. It's basically a little plastic plug that has been infused with uh, a component of queen mandibular pheromone. It's, it's not a complete uh, with all of the, the different components, but it's got all of the main ones in it. And so it temporarily discourages laying workers. It, 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 when you put it in the hive, the bees rub up against it, they get it on their bodies, they spread it around, they probably lick and antennate it thinking, it's, it seems like a queen, but it's not one. I don't quite understand, but it can kind of tie the hive over for up to two weeks, maybe three weeks, make them think they've got a queen while you have a queen on order from another source. And so it will keep them from getting too discouraged. It can also prevent them from uh, starting to uh, produce their own queens or to supersede or anything like that. And, and so it won't completely reliably keep laying workers from developing, but it's, it can certainly help to, to slow it down. Uh, Super Boost is another uh, pheromone product that you can get, and it's an artificial brood pheromone. So uh, of course this increases brood production and discourages laying workers. So when, when bees smell a lot of brood, then it induces pollen foraging so they go out and gather more pollen because they think they have a lot of mouths to feed, a lot of brood to take care of. And the more pollen they're bringing back, the richer the diet fed to the queen will be. And when the queen gets a richer diet, then she indeed lays more eggs. And so that uh, functions to produce 
more brood, which is more brood pheromones, which encourages them to go get more pollen if it is available. So uh, this can be used to kind of jumpstart brood production in the spring. Uh, but if, of course, if there's not a lot of pollen available, then that could backfire on you. But again, it can discourage laying workers if you've got a colony that uh, seems to be developing those or, or can prevent them from uh, occurring if you're, you're changing out queens in, in your colony. Uh, there's been a lot of research in ways to attract bees into crops. So uh, this stuff called fruit boost, it mimics queen mandibular pheromone and you spray it in your orchard and it will attract bees into and among the flowers and hopefully they will do some good pollination while they're there. Uh, another one is called bee scent. It, it, again, it's a number of different attractants and it contains a, an artificial Nazanoff pheromone too. So it attracts worker bees into the flowers and crops. So all of that sounds like a good idea, but I have to kind of wonder what the bees are thinking of this. If you spray this stuff in an orchard and you are making a bunch of peach blossoms smell like queen bees, that may confuse some honeybees. It may attract them to it, but they may not quite register what to do when they get there. So uh, maybe they work great. I've never had any experience with them. Uh, so someone else might be able to, to answer that if someone else has more experience than, than me. But uh, we're, we're kind of playing with, around with these pheromones at a fairly early stage of, of understanding. So it's, uh, it's as though we understand some of the vocabulary uh, of the bees language without really grasping the grammar. So we're, we're using, using some baby talk. So uh, we, you know, there's a lot that, that we can still learn from that. And someday we may be able to uh, communicate with the bees much more effectively, but we're kind of at the, the infancy of our ability to, to do that. So pheromones are involved in just about every interaction between bees uh, in the hive, between different casts, between different individuals, between the whole colony and individuals. So uh, they are important stuff. You don't necessarily have to know all of this scientific background in order to be a good, successful beekeeper. But I think that, uh, you know, understanding some of the, the principles of biology that, that underlie what the bees are, are doing helps us to understand their behavior a little bit more. And, and, and that can help to make us better beekeepers. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you, John. Uh, a real great uh, coverage of all of the different pheromones. We did get some questions. Um, we, I hope we'll be able to get to all of the questions, but let's see uh, how it goes. Um, the, your last of your topics on artificial, I got a couple of them, um, uh, the comments uh, related to that. Um, uh, Amy was wondering, thank you. I was wondering the same thing about the artificial pheromones, uh, some of the material that you covered. Mm -hmm. um, an early question we got from Anthony in New York was, could an artificial queen pheromone be developed that could be sprayed in a hive that is queenless? And while you're waiting to get the replacement queen or, um, that will then, that material will suppress the development of laying workers? Or would the placing of a frame of uncapped brood be adequate in doing the same thing? What type of pheromone must be present to suppress laying workers? Yeah, so you can use that artificial brood pheromone. You can use that, that temp queen, either one. But um, I think that uh, adding actual brood with brood, real brood pheromones to a hive probably will do more to suppress the, uh, the laying workers than, than doing it artificially. But if you're in a situation where maybe you don't have a lot of brood and the colony is maybe um, looking like it's, it's gonna be hopelessly queenless, there might be a situation where you would want to, uh, to add some of that extra stuff in there. So kind of a backup plan. Yeah, indeed so. And on a, sort of on that same theme, uh, again from Anthony, do you think that uh, someday there could be a sensor developed that could be placed in the hive to detect and 
judge hive status based on pheromones. Aren't there already apps that can judge hive status uh, that is like queen right, queenless, et cetera, based on sounds from the hive? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, a lot of interest right now in developing all kinds of sensors for the hives. Um, you know, listening in on those vibrations and sounds, uh, of course, hive weight and humidity and temperature and, and all of that kind of stuff. And there is also interest in developing things that can smell a hive, uh, particularly for diseases. You know, you can train a dog to uh, sniff out American foul brood. And so it's thought that we can develop electronic sensors that would do the same thing. You know, you may have something uh, the size of a credit card, which you just slip down into a hive and it monitors all kinds of things in there and sends you a message uh, to give you an alert when it detects something. But I don't think we're quite to that point, but there's definitely interest in, in developing that kind of stuff. So yeah, stay tuned. I see somebody has a background of bees doing the washboarding maneuver there. And uh, that's something that I did not mention in my talk, but that behavior is kind of mysterious. Nobody really understands what it is, but it's very likely related to pheromones as well. You know, you see that in the, the summertime when there's not a lot of flowers in bloom, you've got a big population. I think they, they send the workers outside to swab the decks just to keep them out of trouble. They'll clean all the, the footprint pheromone off the front of the hive, kind of the way they did with old sailing ships just to keep the sailors out of trouble, keep them from fighting, they'd make them, make them clean the decks all day long. They actually do it inside the hive all the time. Mm -hmm. I have cameras mounted inside and you will see it 60% uh, of the time they'll be uh, washboarding. Hmm. We just only see it when it's on the outside. Mm -hmm. And only in a couple of colonies, not all of them doing it at the same time. That is interesting, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, on the on the laying worker, uh, Doug was wondering, could you could you reverse a laying worker colony? And I presume he's talking, in other words, and applying a pheromone to try to do that reversal. Uh, I think you can save a laying worker colony. Uh, most importantly, by getting another queen in there, but by providing them with a lot of brood you can prevent laying more laying workers from developing, but I don't know that it's possible to take a worker who has become developed into a laying worker and revert her back to a non-laying worker. I think once they reach that stage, they're kind of set in their ways. But if you can get enough other bees in there, they'll kind of clean up after them and, and uh, keep it from going any farther. Ramazani had the, uh, the observation, in Russia, to attract the bees to certain flowers, they mix the flowers of that tree to, to beehive feeder. Um, in other words, they dispense it in the colony so that the bees will go to, like they're trying to target bees to go to pears or strawberries. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I'm not familiar with that, but I, I can see how that would certainly be possible to work. Uh, on the sensors, uh, a follow-up question, uh, Linton asked, what's the status of sensors to interpret pheromones in the hive? Any... That's not really an area of my expertise, so I, I can't really answer that, what the status is. I know that there's a lot of interest in it. There are people working on it, but I don't know really where, where we're at. Maybe somebody else here knows more about that than I do. It's all about the sensors, and there are in um, over in Israel and uh, New Zealand, there's people working on that. Mm -hmm. um, you have to develop first the sensor that that bo that bonds to that particular um, olfactions, and then mm -hmm. then they get a signal. Yeah, but I, I haven't heard much. They were talking to me a couple of both researchers from both countries were talking to me a few years ago, looking at uh, American fabric sensing, and I haven't heard back from them. So I don't know what the status is right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's kind of, thing, of uh, thing. once we once we break through and and we kind of figure out how to do that, then hopefully it can be applied to more and more different molecules to uh, kind of really break that open. But oh, yeah, we kind of got to get over that that hurdle of technology, make it small enough and affordable enough and sensitive enough and to be really practical and affordable for beekeepers. 
Yeah. But, One more thing but, on uh, your um, oh, on ahead, your uh, on your brood pheromone that uh, the the uh, synthetic brood pheromone. As far as I know, they don't contain the E-beta osamine, which is the own larval pheromone, which is really critical on uh, bees recognizing that there's a laying queen in the hive because they smell the E-beta osamine. And Jeff Pettis had a paper years ago that by simply removing the very young larvae and the E-beta osamine from a colony, colonies will start uh, producing queen cells despite having uh, a queen there. So it's not just having the queen, it's the uh, E-beta osamine from the young, young larvae. Um, but that's not, as best I can tell, included in that synthetic brood pheromone. Mm -hmm. That was kind of developed even before, though. Well, you say Pettis' um, uh, study went back a ways, but no, the, that was developed in Canada, and they were not using that. One of the things with sensors, um, as you explained, John, a number of these things uh, that the behave to elicit the behavior is not a single chemical release from a single gland. It is a blend. It is a mixture of one sort or another, which would make a sensor uh, perhaps that much more difficult to accurately be able to, um, you know, give you the information you seek in your high in your beekeeping. It's more like interpreting a symphony, yes, um, or, or music. Yeah. Yeah. Being able no. to pick out the third oboe in the whole orchestra. Uh, maybe, so, I don't know, um, John, uh, if you do, but uh, we had an early question that, do we have pictures or video of a queen laying an egg in a queen cup? Any, read, any listeners on that might know of that, if wow. you want to put that reference, we'd be glad to accept that, put it in the in our our uh, our question and answer. I yeah. don't know that we have any pictures or video of that. I had a discussion with Clarence Collison years ago, and and he was adamant that nobody has ever seen a, a worker or a queen moving an egg from a, a regular cell to a queen cup, and that he was absolutely sure that the queen put them there. There's a there's a quite a bit of evidence to the contrary that they, that bees can do that. I've tried some experiments um, in some of my cell builders by putting in a comb with uh, plastic queen cups pressed in by hand so you know there's no egg in them and you know that the uh, cell starter is queenless. Uh, I've only done limited experiments. I have not yet seen an egg show up in there, but it, um, I should repeat that experiment more and see. But I've, I've researched that and there's some pretty convincing evidence where people have taken the queen and confined her in a cage in a, in a colony and then found queen uh, fertile eggs showing up around there looking like they have been moved. So it's, it's enough to convince me that um, it's not a solved, a solved thing. I wouldn't say it couldn't happen because bees mm -hmm. always, always do something surprising, but. Oh yeah. And when you have a queen excluder in a hive, mm -hmm. it's, it's, I've seen it a number of times in other beekeepers where you'll see a, a fertile leg uh, sh uh, show up above the, the queen excluder. And that's, you know, the, if the, it had been the queen sneaking through, you'd expect to see a lot of fertile legs, but you see the occasional ones. So you just, there's enough to make me have an open mind about that. I think uh, Steve Tabor, uh, he was one of the guys who first reported that one, eggs can be moved around by the workers. And he developed actually forceps uh, to hold the the uh, eggs and move them around, and he modeled the forceps based on the uh, mandibles of the workers. Yes, great. So basically, uh, Steve Tabor he did a lot of work in this area. But okay. seeing uh, talking to Lidlu also in my early days, basically uh, the workers can modify the cells and turn it into queen cup and the mm. eggs inside. And I have a picture for that. Mm. Okay. So it's, it's the other way around. If they know there's a, a cell there, uh, or sorry, egg, but in a position, she, the workers will turn it around into cup. So it's but, kind of the but when they do that, it's, it's very, when you dissect those, that's very easy to, to tell. If it's, yeah. if, if it's an emergency cell, and I've talked to Dave Tarpey about this and other researchers saying, well, what proportion 
of supersedure cells typically are from a, a queen cup, are from a worker uh, larva laid in a, um, a worker cell where they float that larva up to the top with jelly and then turn the cell downward, as opposed to a, um, where the queen actually lays a super, an egg in a supersedure cell. And I have not got, from any researcher I've talked to, I, um, I've dissected quite a few, and I, I find both of them uh, yeah. in supersedure cells. So um, uh, it appears that, that they will use whatever, if the queen doesn't lay an egg in a cell cup, not a swarm cup, but when the bees make, um, especially like Russian bees, if you look at Russian bees, they're constantly building supersedure cells and tearing them down. They're, they've always got backup for the uh, queen bee. Um, and so super, cell, super cells are often started and then torn back, back down again. Um, so that, that, that's another question. There's, uh, we have a lot to learn still. Related to uh, one of the reasons Steve was doing that, uh, that uh, forceps is he actually wanted to graft eggs rather than yeah. using the grafting oh, wow. larva system. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, on the, this issue of um, uh, supersedure, Javier had a question early. Uh, he says, I have observed this behavior on separate occasions and in different breeds when introducing a new queen. Bees accept and let the new queen to lay eggs for about two to three weeks and then begin superseding her and will continue to try even when I remove the queen cells until I miss one and then they supersede. Could you please explain why this happens? So they allow her to lay eggs for a couple of weeks and then they supersede her. It may be that they want to make sure they've got some material from which to, to raise another queen. So they don't like her, but they don't have another source of eggs. So they're, they're going to have to allow her to lay for a little while. Maybe they think uh, there's a hope she's going to get better, but she didn't. I can add one thing here. Just the, over the last couple of years, I've been actually looking at queens to answer the same question because here we get about 300,000 queens imported. And we have this report of that three, four weeks or six weeks, the queen will supersede. And just after we this looked at about three to 400 queens, 20 to 40% of the queens coming was what, less than 1 million sperm supposed to have from four and above, like most likely six. Everybody was looking at uh, shipping status, heat, all of the stuff. However, we are finding just a simple answer to the question, there's not enough sperm. And again, if the hormone works with the whole system uh, reacting to each other, if there is no sperm and the queen like, is not performing well and the hormone is not right, just to supersede that queen. We see, this. Really we see this. We see this in our nucleus colony. Pardon? We see this in our nucleus colonies, where the queen has made it in the nucleus. We we make about three thousand nucleus colonies every year. Yeah. And and, and we track them, and there, there's a, a decent rate of supersedure in a queen that has never been shipped, never been exposed to any mitocides or synthetic chemicals, um, and made it in that in that nucleus colony. It takes off, is laying well, and and they get superseded. That's just a a natural thing that happens. Actually, this is a good point, Randy, because a uh, few things happen here. I have some guys who are raising their queens, but they were putting 200 nukes in one location. Mm -hmm. uh, however, so the queen quality was not, uh, it was it was okay. The limiting factors, the number of drones, and we found actually some of those queens about five to 10% less, uh, like less than uh, 1 million sperm. So I would be sure. interested to know some of these nukes, if you take sample of the drones, uh, sorry, of the queens, queens after yeah. mating and look at them. Yeah. And this is a major problem because we are getting all of our queens for com from commercial producers, queen producers, who ship to Canada every single week, five to 10,000 queens. Yeah. So to me, how many drones out there <laughs> enough to meet with those queens? You know, one of the things when people ask me about uh, buying queens, I said, look at the weather report from the area of that queen producer and see whether it's been raining for two weeks. And if they're sell sell selling fresh queens and the weather's been lousy there, um, I wouldn't buy them. <laughs> I know from my own experience, 
you, you get a lot of lousy queens if the weather's been, been bad, but if these guys are filling all their orders. So I tell people, check California weather <laughs> reports. I'll tell you a lot how that how your queen colony is going to be. I have the same situation. One guy had a bad weather. She sent me some queens, and we said, no, these queens are duds. So about three, 400 queens, he had to replace them right away. He could not afford it. Like oh, yeah. That's the kind of... But the practice itself does not allow that in seasonality. So Yeah, like, the, the pressure upon those queen producers early in the spring is yeah. intense and with, with our nukes we just said, tell people uh we're not going to sell you a nuke that was made it out during lousy weather so just wait so you know we, we will put off our orders and tell them hey you know <laughs> if you want something else go somewhere else if you want us to stand behind our queens wait until the weather's good enough for them to mate we are we are so dependent on those queens uh, <clears throat> john there are some other questions that have come you up know, I I had, a, I had a thought, if, if I can interrupt, I had a thought about, uh, you know, electronic devices to, to sample pheromones <laughs> inside the hive we were discussing earlier. You know, some of the pheromones are indeed airborne, but some of them are passed B to B. Most of the worker pheromones are the ones that are airborne. And so if you want to judge queen quality, you're not really probably going to be able to do that with judging the the airborne qualities in the hive they're they're passed um, basically in the food they're picked up from the the body of the queen or, or from her mandibles and those are the ones that you really want to be able to gauge to gauge queen quality so mm -hmm. they're, that's not going to be something we can easily detect with a, a little airborne sensor so yeah another way you could do it a met hat is uh, what Boris Bear uh, did over in Australia. And they uh, looked at the eggs and they could uh, tell how many sperm had, had actually uh, attached that egg. Now one fertilizes it, but typically on average, a, a queen who's well made it has about two sperm hit each egg, one of which fertilizes it. But they, were, they then looked to see. And when that ratio of sperm starts to drop, that's indicating that that queen is running low on sperm. That's when she gets superseded. So that would be an indirect way to measure the mated quality of a queen without having to kill the queen. Take a look at the eggs she's laying and, and look at the number of sperm per egg. Yeah. Well, actually, we're trying to find just a practical thing, and we are trying to work with each person, study their case, and give them some directions. And actually, within one year, we were able to move from two million and a half to four million and a half by just simple split the number of nukes in different yards, make uh -huh. sure every, a lot of drones and just watch the weather. If the weather is really bad, don't take that uh, batch of queens. Yeah. Three I, I, right I know away. there are sometimes extremely large, I mean, like in the thousands in a single yard meeting on the same day. Um, and I, I know with, with us, we've had, and we don't put a thousand in a yard, but we'll, you know, uh, we, you know, we typically have, you know, uh, 40 nukes or so in a yard, but there's been times when the weather has held those queens and I walk outside and I'll just say, there is an orgy happening above our heads right now. I can hear the drones, <laughs> man, and, and you may have, you know, a few hundred queens mate in, in minutes and you go to those nukes and pull them out and you'll see mating sign on every other queen, which means they've just come back from mating and it happens that, that temperature hits right about 70 degrees and they just come roaring out of those hives and they you have mass mass meetings. Yeah. No, I actually, that's a, for simple things, I found a sperm count, it really, it's, uh, it's been overlooked, but we are looking at more details of stuff without knowing actually how many sperm inside the spermatica from the first time. Mm -hmm. One lady I'm sent uh, five queens to me. Pardon? Go ahead. Finish your point. Now, one lady Edit. sent me five queens, and actually, I found one. Four of them, like it's about seven or eight million. One queen was one uh, about two millions, and I was quite surprised. And she sent back because she it's a stag with a green uh, color. So I, I called her up and I said, "What's going on here?" She said, "You know, sorry, I sent you an old queen. I was replacing her in those in that patch." Right. So I was able to figure this out <laughs> by doing that. So it's kind of in a way, as I said, 
there is a lot of simple uh, tests can be done. Definitely can give us indication and uh, provide answers right away to the beekeepers. And all of this related to, uh, definitely to the queen performance and for moons and all of this reaction inside the hive. What's the screen? I really so, appreciate uh, Matt Hat oh. and Randy for oh. your contributions this evening as well as as well as mm -hmm. our speaker John. John, there are some other questions. I wonder if you would stay on and and maybe try to answer the questions that are in the Q and A. Well, we're going to take a short break. Uh, we have two more uh, to talk about uh, presentations this evening. Um, so I hope that uh, you'll come back. We're going to take about a four minute uh, break. I'll start the break with the announcement that our March mini conference will be uh, at an unusual day and time. The date will be March 11th. It will be 10 a.m. And it's to accommodate a speaker coming in from France, Roderick Wheatley, who focuses on breeding of Apis mellifera, the black bees. So our next one in March will be March 11th, a Saturday at 10 a.m. Uh, so, gosh, thank you so much for allowing me to uh, share a little bit about my beekeeping and a, a little bit about the state of Oregon. Um, I really appreciate it. It's a very hard act to follow. This was an excellent presentation tonight, and the discussion was just equally uh, great. So thank you very much. A little background for me. Uh, I grew up in Oregon's Willamette Valley. I trained as a pharmacist at Oregon State University, and I spent most of my professional career in Seattle uh, teaching uh, pharmacy students and uh, managing the university's Drug Information Center. Today I'm retired. I live on a 360 acre sheep ranch in a very sparsely populated area um, towards Hell's Canyon in the northeast corner of Oregon. I started keeping bees four years ago. I started with a single nucleus colony in this long Langstroth hive that you see to the in the photograph. Um, and I am a foundationless uh, frame uh, beekeeper. One colony uh, grew to four, which I was really thrilled about, and then to 12, which I was astounded by, and then to 21, which I was um, over the moon happy with. And uh, today, uh, this year, I expect to max out at 30 colonies, which is about as many as I think I can handle as a single person uh, working these hives. I currently have a, a, a about equal amounts of traditional Langstroth stacked boxes, these long hives that I really like. But my favorite hive is the insulated hive. I'm using the Appy May hive. And in the few years that I've been beekeeping, I think that my bees overwinter better in those hives. And I think that they uh, come out of spring earlier, which is really important in the area where I live. During the COVID years, I uh, took the opportunity of having a little extra time and I completed the University of Montana's online apprentice level and natural beekeeping courses. Both were excellent. Um, I worked uh, with a small group of local beekeepers to start a uh, formalized bee club. We incorporated the Wallowa County beekeepers, and I served as that club's first president. We've grown from a beginning number of eight to 16 beekeepers, and we probably have two or three uh, uh, going to start this, this year in, in bees. Uh, that probably represents about close to half of the beekeepers that are keeping bees in our county. Uh, so we're really pleased with that. Uh, during the COVID uh, lockdown, I also got extremely hooked on Zoom bee conferences. Um, that's how I learned about WAS. Um, I, I wanted to uh, advocate for those Zoom conferences to continue after the lockdown was over. So I joined WAS and I um, also volunteered uh, as the Oregon representative when that opportunity became available. Um, this is just a little reminder to me that um, you can see where my apiary is located up there in the Northeast corner of, or of Oregon where Washington, Oregon and Idaho come together. And um, it, it just is, interesting to me that 
the, the climatic area covers those three states. But I can tell you for sure that beekeeping along the Pacific Ocean in this direction, in Washington above me, Hell's Canyon is right here. So over uh, on the other side of Hell's Canyon and to the south of me, the beekeeping conditions are, ex are very, very diff significantly different. So this is an aerial view of our, uh, the area where our ranch is. I keep bees along this cliff, down this uh, fence line, and in and, uh, and a little spot right here. Um, uh, essentially, the, the landscape goes straight up from, uh, th from this cliff. And if you could see the uh, other side of the valley as well, you would see the, the landscape goes straight up on that side as well. So we're in this V-shaped canyon. This is the Wallawa River that runs through here. And the only, um, the, the only thing that's not rangeland or um, conservation reserve uh, land is this little tiny alfalfa field right, right here. So my bees are foraging mainly on the wildflowers and the few fruit trees that I have in my garden and the other things that I planted for them in the garden. Um, uh, but mostly, uh, mostly rangeland. If we think about Wallowa County or Wallowa Valley versus the rest of Oregon, our region is really pristine. We're, we're really isolated up there in the northeast corner of Oregon. There's only one road in and one road uh, out, and that road goes uh, winds down into Hell's Canyon. Um, uh, mostly open grazing lands, very few swaths of industrial croplands, uh, just a really pristine environment. Um, other beekeepers in Oregon consider us to be short season high country beekeepers. Our bees are subjected to very, very high winds, winds that will blow down your barn if you keep the door open. Uh, long cold winters, short cold springs, and dry cool summers. We really don't have much in the way of um, uh, extreme heat here, except that uh, time a couple of years ago when we, I think we were probably all trapped under that heat, heat dome. Our average uh, rainfall is about 17 uh, inches a year and about three times that much in snowfall. I always get a laugh out of our frost dates. Our first frost date is listed as July 15th. I'm sorry, our last frost date is listed as July 15th. And our first frost date is less than 30 days um, uh, after that. So we have, a, we have a very short growing season. Um, we are supposed to be... Um, um, uh, uh, horticultural zone uh, five, uh, but that has not been my experience with the plants I try to grow. So I think I think we're really uh, getting colder in this area, and I think that our zone is closer to four than it is to five. We do have one migratory beekeeper that comes into our valley. He brings in two thousand hives in the spring and then trucks them out in the fall before it gets cold. He overwinters those hives indoors in Southern Oregon and, um, and then is off to the almonds, followed by uh, pollination contracts in the apples. And then he brings, um, brings his bees back to into Willowick County for the rest of the spring and summer. I just wanna, um, just wanna drive this point home that all beekeeping is local. Oregon is divided into these eight agricultural regions. The, um, the plant growing zones range from nine over on the coastal area along the Pacific Ocean, um, eight in the very fertile Wallowa Valley. Um, and then um, over here, we're at what I think is four. And in the middle here, we're in uh, zone uh, six and seven. Hell's Canyon is right, right in this area here. And on the other side of Hell's Canyon in Idaho, it is zone seven. So uh, we, we are a little different here. Um, um, in, in thinking about um, our, my bees, um, if I were to report to you how my beekeeping season went, 
it it just wouldn't be very representative of how the beekeeping season went in the rest of this um, in the rest of this state. Um, along the coastal uh, coastal region, I understand. I've never seen them myself, but I understand that they grow some cranberries, and the the bees would definitely be active in the cranberries. In the Willamette Valley, it's said to be among the most diverse agricultural regions on earth um, with more than 170 different crops being grown. In the mid-Columbia area, this is the Hood River area. Uh, they're very famous for their fruit, fruit trees and that's where our commercial beekeeper um, takes his colonies after the almonds on his way into Northeastern Oregon. Um, the Columbia Plateau, um, uh, when I was a child, the Columbia Plateau was simply desert and sagebrush, but the Columbia River runs along here and they have begun to irrigate that land and now they're growing wheat and they're pretty, uh, pretty uh, amazing uh, watermelon and other kinds of melon growers in that area. Um, uh, Central Oregon, that's the Bend area, again, is a high desert, um, and they typically grow some specialty seeds, some garlic, and, and um, all the areas in Oregon, I think, are involved in the production of hay. Uh, Southeast-wise, uh, very low rainfall. It's mostly uh, rangeland for cattle, uh, very dry, and, um, uh, and not much rain. Finally, in Southern Oregon, you get into a climate that's more like Northern California, and their um, uh, some of their major crops are the tree fruits and the and the wine grapes. So that's that's really all I had to say. I just uh, I am up I'm up here in the very tippy top corner of Oregon, and there's a lot more beekeepers uh, from from the central area to the left towards the Pacific Ocean than there are out here in the Northwest, in the Northeast. Thank you. Thank you, Dal. Uh, great uh, introduction to your bees and, uh, and uh, certainly one of those uh, on a trajectory. Uh, uh, I certainly hope that the Valley, the Willow Valley will support your 30 along with all those from the commercial beekeeper. That's a lot of bees <laughs> in an area that, that isn't have an awful lot of forage. Ron Miska, Ron is going to talk a little bit about um, our upcoming plans for um, WAS. Yeah, hi, that's that's absolutely great. You can uh, you can hear me now, I hope? I, we can. All right, thank you very much, Dewey. Okay, and can you see that screen? We can indeed. Okay, so it's a big Yahoo. Uh, we have, um, well, in the next 10 minutes, what I'm going to try to do is try to convince you that um, coming to Calgary for the 2023 AGM and conference is going to be a great opportunity for everybody to see, um, to meet each other, get together, and enjoy our area. It's just a fantastic place to, uh, to, to be. And I'm going to only spend about 10 minutes on this, so be patient with it. But first of all, I thought I should address you know, like, why are we going to be coming to Calgary to do this? Um, well, first of all, WAS has not had a conference in Canada in a couple of decades. So we feel like we could attract a lot of Canadians to uh, come to the conference and we can focus on our theme, which we have chosen to be Northern Lights Beekeeping. In other words, beekeeping in the far, far north. We have a number of provinces and uh, the state of Alaska, and of course the, the northern tier of, of the Western United States, um, where most of what we're going to be discussing will be very relevant. Um, but I think also people who will be visiting from other parts of the United States are gonna find it really fascinating to see how we produce the big honey crops we get here and how we manage to winter bees uh, as we do. So another reason to, to pick Calgary, why Calgary, is uh, we have about 400 beekeepers right here in the, uh, in the, in the community around Calgary. Within, uh, let's say, 20 kilometers, we have 400 people keeping bees, and we're in an area that is uh, very 
volunteer oriented. And with that in mind, we already have had 45 people contact us in one way or another, wanting to come on board and help put off this, put on this really great conference that we'll have at the end of September. So Calgary it is. And um, I could add that Calgary is a really fun place to come to, to visit. Uh, it's a tourist destination. It's close to the mountains. It's close to the Badlands. We have our annual stampede, and uh, um, which which uh, is basically a huge rodeo or, or or the equivalent of a state fair. That's all. That's in July, so you're not going to be here during that. But there will be a lot of stuff going on. The city of Calgary has uh, uh, professional sports. We have various musical festivals. We've got cultural and historic and art museums. We also have Canada's National Music Museum. So for just a few bucks, you can slip into the museum and you can uh, see the wedding dress that uh, Katie Lang got married in. You can see Hank Snow's tiny little suit. I'd never realized Hank Snow was such a small person. And you can see the piano that Elton John wrote about half of his biggest hits on. Um, lots to see, lots to do. As I say, just an hour from the Rocky Mountains. These, these pictures in this scene are all in Calgary. Um, just pictures that I, I photographed myself, actually. Um, one from an airplane window, um, the others just uh, in and around Calgary. So I'm not a great photographer. I expect that anybody else who's coming up here is going to see a lot of really nice and entertaining and interesting things. So, so Calgary it is. Now, where is Calgary? Uh, you might not realize we're just three hours north of Montana. Um, we're in the uh, province of Alberta. And, um, and we are just a couple of three hours flight distance away from quite a few cities in the United States. So last fall, September-ish, 1st of October, I flew to Chicago and back, um, and it cost me $500 Canadian money for the return fare. That was $350 in US dollars. I just checked today, the cost of flying into Calgary and back home again would set you back about 750 if you're coming out of Dallas. I uh, visited a sister of mine in San Diego uh, about a year ago, and that cost me $200 US. And for some reason, Portland, Oregon was up at $350 US, but that's return fare. So the fares aren't going to break you if you were looking for a really fun and different place to have a holiday. And it's certainly going to um, be worthwhile for what you'll learn and who you'll meet and what you'll be able to do in and around our area. So certainly hope that that doesn't prohibit anybody from coming. We're going to be staying and we're going to be having our, our, uh, our talks at the Great Eagle Resort. This is uh, just on the edge of Calgary. I'll show you in a minute how it fits into the Calgary scene. But it is um, a newish resort and it has... Uh, well, if you look at the bottom of my screen, you'll see that according to people who use TripAdvisor, 2,600 people reviewed it and gave it an average four and a half uh, points out of five. And Gray Eagle ranked number four among the 116 hotels in Calgary. So this um, venue committee that, that chose this, and I have to, to send out a, a, a very warm and grateful thanks to the people who actually found this venue and communicated with it, and l they looked at about a dozen different places before um, uh, being able to settle on the Gray Eagle, but that would be uh, Keith Bellingham uh, and Liz Goldie. So the two of them really, they, they uh, entered, I think, about 12 different locations in Calgary, made a list of about 20 attributes, looking at all the things that we probably need and want in a good conference location. And this came up, um, actually number two in their list, but it was the most affordable. And it so it's not number one in Calgary, it's number four among all hotels in Calgary. Uh, and it was their, their one of their two top choices. So this is where we're going on the basis of price and convenience and uh, location and parking and so many other things, the Great Eagle Resort came in as the best choice for us. Just a quick peek inside, like it's um, standard, 
and it's not you know a a five star place it's it's probably a four um it's very very comfortable a very nice uh, uh conference rooms able to uh certainly hold all of the events that we have planned for the three days of the conference and uh, location so if you can see my mouse moving around here i don't know if you can but this is where the gray eagle resort is so gray eagle resort is on the tsutina nation this is a look this is a, a uh, uh, traditional homeland for the tsutina people and they built this casino and resort right at the corner of their property so they would be very close actually pretty much inside of, the, of Calgary, not quite in the city limits, but very convenient. 14 kilometers to the downtown, straight arrow is only seven kilometers, um, but it takes 14 kilometers to drive to the downtown where you saw those earlier pictures, and you'll fly into the airport here, unless you're driving, of course, and from here, you're gonna hop on an Uber, which will be um, available in a few months at the Calgary airport, as well as taxis, which are always available there, and, uh, or you rent a car. And I would suggest if you're interested in doing a little bit more than seeing Calgary and the immediate surroundings, you're gonna want to rent a vehicle because it's just an hour or so to the west and you're up in the mountains and an hour and so uh, off to the east and you're in some beautiful badland country. Most of the honey produced in Alberta comes from the uh, area mostly to the north of us, although there are some very large beekeeping outfits in to the east and to the south of the city of Calgary. And we are hopefully going to, well, we will have tours of some of their facilities, some of their huge, huge overwintering um, units where they store beehives inside during the winters. Um, anyhow, uh, about, about 15 or 20 US dollars will get you downtown and about uh, 50 US dollars will get you down from the airport, which is about 35 kilometers on the, on the road. Um, just a little over half an hour to get to the venue site. If you're driving, there's a lot of lot of free parking there, and um, and and actually it's it's a semi-rural location, so you've got a nice view of the mountains off to the west. And we also have permission to set up some bee colonies, uh, so we may be demonstrating uh, winter wrapping, uh, condition of colonies going into the fall, uh, since it will be early October, late September when we're, when we're doing this. So we'll have some workshops planned to take advantage of this particular location as well. Okay. So, uh, that's where we sit within Calgary and why, why do you want to come here? You want to learn about what beekeeping is like when you have colonies of bees producing 30 and 40 pounds of honey. That's not nectar, that's finished honey in a day. Um, these pictures were taken back in the 70s, and, uh, or this picture, and this is real. I mean, the, the, guy, the guy is on, uh, on stilts or something. I don't know how he's doing it, but, uh, but that's how you had to handle colonies of bees in Alberta when the honey flow hit just right. We still produce an awful lot of honey. Uh, per hive here because we have such long days during the summer. We have a short season, which means all the flowers that of great interest to the bees, the various types of clover, sweet clover, alfalfa, canola, those are our principal honey sources, all producing water white honey, very mild honey, uh, so extremely good quality. I think Alberta may have the highest, well, I shouldn't say Alberta, but the western prairies of Canada has probably the highest average over the years of honey that is of good quality. And uh, not to diss on the folks I know down in Australia, but um, they produce huge honey crops at times from eucalyptus, but it's not the water white kind of honey and it's not as consistently produced as what we get here. So our long days are the huge advantage. You've gotta be prepared for that. You've gotta have enough supers. You've gotta have your colonies in peak condition. So there's a lot to learn about that about handling these big crops, about producing these big crops. We also have long winters here. So we're gonna have a focus with our Northern Lights beekeeping theme. We're going to have a focus on, on how we winter, 
and how do we prepare bees and how much insulation do they need? How many people are using wintering um, units, buildings to park their hives in and what kind of shape are they in when they're there? We'll also talk about extreme weather, which we seem to be getting more and more of and how that impacts our crops. So there's, there's a lot and a lot more than this that we would be covering, but the main focus and what we're looking for from speakers are abstracts that will um, uh, recognize that their presentations are going to be something in the general uh, topic area of northern beekeeping. Although, of course, we would not turn down a, a really interesting talk about anything else. Uh, diseases are relevant almost everywhere. Um, and just generally, you know, like that phenomenal talk we just listened to, I mean, that, that's the sort of thing we would certainly hope to attract. But our focus will be on Northern Lights beekeeping. So what about Alberta? Um, these are the average honey productions from colonies of bees in Alberta going back to 1920. So early on in, uh, in the first few years of the record keeping, we did not even have alfalfa and sweet clover in the province yet. When it arrived around 1930, the average honey crop shot up to over 200 pounds. And then we have years that are dry, years that are good, years that are windy, years that are good, years that freeze, you know, back and forth. So a lot of oscillation going on here. And it looks like the oscillation is converging on a lower number than you would expect. Good beekeepers in Alberta typically can produce 200 pounds from their entire outfit as a very regular thing. Um, many of them do. The reason our, our, our average has fallen can yeah, down to about 140 pounds, 130 in that range recently is mostly because we count the colonies of bees that go into canola pollination, which is a relatively new thing here for us. So when bees go into canola pollination, they stock um, hundreds of colonies per, per square kilometer um, in, instead of a, 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 of a relatively small handful as they used to do and um, overstocking gets really good pollination for the seed canola but it reduces the honey crop. Roughly 20 or 30 percent of all the colonies of bees in Alberta that are owned commercially are hauled into canola. So with that averaged in basically a very small honey crop if any produced during the canola bloom. Um, then that does reduce our overall average and it makes it more stable because year after year, um, you know, that number of bees is, is pulling that average down and kind of, kind of um, t uh, tamping off the, uh, the fluctuation there, the variation. Okay, so lots of honey. Where does it come from? It comes from our bees. Um, near the Rockies, we can depend on really good flows from alfalfa and sweet clover. Off into the prairie areas, it's more canola, but the alfalfa and sweet clovers still contribute a lot to it too. This is uh, just typical farmland around a lot of Alberta, very black, rich soil. Again, there's long days, just the right amount of rainfall, just enough sunshine. Actually, we have quite a bit of sunshine in Alberta, and that certainly helps produce, uh, produce our honey crops. So, so all in all, some alfalfa, um, all in all, we want you here. We want you to enjoy this. We want you to see this. We want to talk about it with you. So we are really hoping that you'll be up here in late September, staying at the Gray Eagle, um, maybe renting a car and heading off to the mountains about an hour or so to the west, uh, perhaps taking in some of the badlands and uh, the dinosaur fossil beds are phenomenal out in, in the uh, east country just outside of Calgary. And Calgary there in the middle. Uh, just, uh, just hoping that everybody will have a chance to do this. We're, we're really looking forward to seeing you. So let me hop back in here, turn my camera back on. And, um, and am I still sharing my screen? Oh, no, you're back live. Nope, I'm back live. Okay, that's what I wanted. Okay, perfect. All right, so. Um, Are there any... some questions for, uh, for Ron? Um, at this point, Nella is still on. Uh, is, uh, if you have a question for Nella as well or for Ron.
We will have a lot more information coming to you about the uh, upcoming conference, the live conference. And I'll repeat that the next mini conference in uh, March will be a Saturday, uh, the day before we change clocks. So we'll make sure you, you get the right time indicated. It'll be March 11th, it'll be at 10 a.m. on Saturday. We appreciate all of you that have stayed with us for the uh, for our presentations this evening. Uh, we've gone over just a bit, and but thank you for staying with us. Uh, if you do have questions, uh, um, please. Uh, and it did not get answered. I have put my email in the uh, in the uh, question and answer. So uh, direct uh, direct to me or to our WAS website, and we'll be able to try to answer them as well. I see we have one on that has come up on travel trailers, Ron. Um, yeah, the um, the venue has told us that um, there won't be any plug-in facilities for travel trailers, but people are welcome to camp out uh, in their parking lot. So, so that's a extremely kind bonus from them. So, if you are coming in in a in a um, a camper or a travel trailer and you want to park, you won't have electricity unless you bring your own um, and you won't have um, uh, any other fac facilities other than going into the hotel, which will be, you know, a few dozen steps away from where you'll be parking. So that's what we've been told now. If that changes, we'll let everybody know. And uh, as this thing progresses, like this is, you know, the planning committee has gotten this far. Um, many thanks to the people who are on that venue committee and selecting this, this location, getting really good cost. Uh, Liz Goldie has, has posted that there is a group rate. Then when you book your uh, room, you're going to want to mention their code number. And I think uh, Etienne will see that um, the WAS website is updated and we'll have a link to, uh, to, to book your room directly from the WAS website too. So that's some information that's being provided by the resort itself. Um, it's gonna be fun, it's gonna be fun. And, um, and, and yeah, uh, the dates, um, I get this wrong every time, but uh, it's the Friday, the last Friday of September, which I think is the 29th, and then Saturday will be the 30th. So the 29th, we hope to have uh, the workshops on and, uh, and an AGM uh, meeting, uh, brief meeting uh, on that Friday uh, afternoon or towards evening, and um, a meet and greet followed the next day with um, plenary uh, presentations, and um, uh, then, then two days of talks. And then the Monday, which is October 2nd, will um, allow people to take beekeeping tours around the area. So late September, last couple of days of September, first couple of days of October. Uh, yeah, um, Medhat has asked, is there a campground for RV around the area? There certainly are campgrounds for RVs, yes. Yeah, we'll get that out in a package of information uh, so people will know that they can do that. The rates at the um, venue are really quite reasonable and um, some, some of the, the lowest in the city for the, um, uh, for, the, for the quality of a location that we've got. So really encourage people to stay right on site so you can wander up and down uh, during the, uh, the conference itself. And um, yeah, we're going to have a call for abstracts. It's another question that popped up here. Uh, don't have the, the date decided, but we just got this venue in the last couple of days and, and everything confirmed. In fact, I was out today uh, at the location in person and got the contract signed and got everything uh, uh, dotted and crossed and, and we're ready to go with this. So the abstract information will come out soon. I'd, I'd like to see the abstracts. Um, they will help us to choose who will be presenting, but they're also going to be combined into a, uh, a part of, of the program for everybody to, to be able to have uh, and, and uh, yeah, 